And today's webinar, which will look at how housing providers can use their data better to make smarter decisions. I'm Martin Hilditch, Deputy Editor of Inside Housing Magazine, and the aim is for today's session, organised with Devlin, to provide some top tips for landlords looking to plan for the future in today's volatile environment. I'll be introducing our fantastic panellists and talking through the technical ins and outs of today's session in a few moments. But first, a bit of context. We're li living, of course, in a world that is changing rapidly. In the space of the year, we've had Brexit, a change in Prime Minister, and now a general election. Social landlords have been forcibly made to cut their rents by 1% a year, which has had a big impact on business planning. And then there is the ongoing implementation of various strands of welfare reform. That's just the policy environment. Then we've got things like wider demographic and technological changes to think about. On top of all this, housing associations are becoming increasingly diverse and complex businesses in order to subsidize their social purpose. So certainly a complex environment to navigate, and certainly historically, data collection and usage in the sector is notoriously patchy. But don't worry, this webinar is designed to help providers think about how they can improve their forward planning using their existing data. It will include practical suggestions and examples about how they can lift their ability to draw insights from their data and turn those insights into better decisions. And it will provide some pointers about the data that will be of greatest value looking into the future. We'll be looking at everything from understanding business costs, service quality, how to better target investment in communities or use data to galvanize sensible structural change. So there's a huge amount for our panel to get their teeth into this morning. We've assembled an expert group with a range of practical experience to help answer these challenges. In a moment, we'll be kicking things off with Kate Kroku, Head of Strategy and Business Intelligence with Hyde, about its asset intelligence model. Then we'll be hearing from Mira Bankhead, Head of Research and Analysis with Genesis, about the way it uses customer data to make evidence-based decisions. Next up is Andy Bradley, Strategic Insight Manager at Sovereign, about how it uses data to inform its strategic direction, I'll put my teeth in. And last but not least, we'll be getting an overview from Paul Clark, Director of Devlin, and finding about, about, out about the results of its work with um, businesses in the sector. But before we um, launch, I'll just talk you through a little bit about how the webinar works. Um, so if you're listening in, um, there's a, a question box um, uh, on the right-hand side, so if people can fire questions at the panelists, um, uh, during their presentations and they'll pick up the, the questions uh, after they finish their presentations and indeed other panelists will be answering as, as we go along. So keep those questions coming in because it, um, uh, it's there for you to ask um, the, the experts we've got lined up um, uh, you know, uh, their, their, their thoughts and um, to, to pick up tips that you can use practically moving forwards. Um, so yeah, keep those questions coming, and I'd remind the panelists that we're, we're looking at about um, 10 minutes each per presentation, um, so we've got plenty of time for questions at the end. Right, um, without further ado, I'd like to kick things off in style with Kate Kroku from Hyde. Kate, it's over to you. Good morning. Um, I'm Kate Kroku from the Hyde Group. I'm just going to make sure my screen is showing. Can someone confirm it is? Someone who's not on mute, can people see my screen? Yeah. Good, excellent. Right, um, I'm Kate Kroku, I'm Head of Strategy and Business Intelligence at the Hyde Group. Um, a, a somewhat grandiose title, which I will talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, for those of you who don't know Hyde, um, we were established about 50 years ago. Um, we, we actually had our 50th birthday a couple of weeks ago down in Brighton. Um, we operate across London and the southeast of England. That's the map on the right-hand side. Um, well, so although the majority of our stock is in London, um, we do actually go up as far north as, as Peterborough and we cover quite a lot of um, the south coast as well. Um, our stock is, is mainly general needs, but we've also got quite a number of leaseholders, um, shared owners um, and outright sale customers as well. Um, Hyde has an annual turnover of about 350 million um, and that equates to about 50,000 homes and about 100,000 or so um, customers. Um, we are a developer as well so that plays a part in, in our business planning um, and we're also part of the G15 group which is a group of, of, of large London-based housing associations. Um, so back to that, that slightly grandiose job title at the beginning. Um, at Hyde, about, about 
mm, about seven years ago actually, um, we made a decision to create a dedicated business intelligence team. Um, and the re reason we decided to make that switch was really about changing our approach to, to data. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about that um, before I moved on to show you some examples of, of how we've used data and analysis to make decisions. Um, so we took the decision um, to combine um, all the people we needed from, from extracting raw data from our various systems and from the external environment, um, extracting, storing and transforming it through to analysing it and, and uh, all the way through to what do we do with it. So um, my team covers data warehouses, analysts um, and also our strategy team as well. Um, how is business intelligence different from data analysis? Is it just a fancy title? Um, some might argue it is, but really the difference for us is about what we do with the data. Um, so it's about it being uh, not just presenting people with numbers, um, it's actually talking to people about what that means, what does it mean for Hyde, what does it mean for our customers, um, and we, also, we always use the principle that our, our insight should be greater than the sum of its parts. Um, I've got two examples to share with you um, of where we've recently um, taken some data, transformed it using different tools and generated some insight which, which wasn't previously available to the group as we looked at it in our old form. Um, both examples relate to our assets um, and that is it's a good indication of where a lot of our focus is at the moment. Um, we are really focused on, on maximising our own financial capacity capacity um, in using that financial capacity to, to fund our services but also to fund our development program. Um, the examples I'm about to show you, um, some of you may have seen similar things before, um, we aren't necessarily the first or, or maybe even the best but um, we're just happy to share what we've done and I hope, I hope you find it interesting. So our first example um, is our grandly titled Asset Intelligence Model, uh, known as AIM. We do like an acronym in housing. Um, and what this is, is it, it started life as an Excel spreadsheet back in, in 2012. Um, and it's, it's since then it's been um, developed, evolved, refined, um, and it's now actually a live model in our, in our data warehouse that gets daily updates. Um, what it is essentially is it is a model that takes all of our properties and pulls information from various of our own systems about the financial performance of those assets, um, performance about the, the operational performance of those assets, and also external data as well. Um, so we've got uh, asset performance, so the decency of the stock, its energy efficiency, its condition, um, demand for the type of asset, so we look at, at void loss, local demand, tenancy turnover, um, we look at location, so that's whether it's in an area where we're actively developing. Thing. We look at our density in that area and our market share and we also take into consideration um, the neighbourhood. So what's the sense of place like? Um, what's the level of ASB, deprivation, what's customer satisfaction with the property? Um, we use this information in, in a few different ways. Um, some people use those individual component bits of information to make decisions, um, but so quite often we use uh, an overall property score. So, so each of those elements are weighted and we come up with a, a score for each property. Um, the map on the right hand side, uh, that shows the new cross area of Lewisham for people who aren't familiar with, with that area. And those little dots you can see um, are our stock in that area. The dark purple shows the properties with the highest overall score um, and the peach and pink colours show um, properties with a medium score. Um, there are a few with blue and green dots which you can't see in this picture which are our ones with the lowest overall score um, and I'll talk a little bit more um, in a moment. Um, so on to how we use it then. Um, really we use this information based at an individual property level, so you can see here we're looking at it in a GIS system, looking at a particular area which individual assets are performing, um, and we also use it um, at an overarching area, um, at an overarching level as well, so to look at particular portfolios of property. Um, so we group together um, things by location, by age, by tenure type, um, by MPV, to so look at how we can get the most out of, out of a portfolio of assets. 
A uh, couple of examples. So aim and action. This is a visualization from Tableau. People who've used it before. Um, and this really, this is showing us looking at assets as a group. Um, so the little picture on the left-hand side. Um, this is showing the, the non-financial performance of our assets. Um, and the one on the left-hand side is showing that grouped by local authority. And the table on the right-hand side shows the performance grouped by tenure. Um, in case you're wondering what the weighting is, um, the darker colours indicate the higher weighting and, and the main thing that's driving um, the performance in the in the information you can see is largely around density and demand um, so this is showing you where we've got the largest density of assets but also the highest demand for property as well so it's all very exciting but, but back to my original point about we like to focus on what are we actually doing with the information um, so so what so I mentioned before um, we use this information at an individual level um, so we use it to assess uh, voids for um, either disposal or potential investment or possibly even a change of use. Um, we've used it to mark up all our lowest scoring properties across the group, so they're now flagged on our database. Um, so as and when they become void, they are immediately passed on to the asset management team um, to be reviewed rather than sitting with the local team for a while while they decide what to do with it. Um, we've also, and on the basis of that, um, Hyde's got an active of program of disposal. So looking at assets that don't fit our needs anymore, um, either they don't fit with our geographical um, area, our footprint. Um, we also particularly look at assets that are perhaps um, in need of quite a lot of repair. Do they represent good value for Hyde? Do they represent good value for our customers? Um, would, we, would we actually be better to, to sell that property on and reinvest the capital that we get into building new homes and services? Um, and also the slightly controversial area, it's been in discussion for a while around high value assets. So looking at assets that we've got um, in particular areas that have a very high value attached to them, we might look at that and say, um, is this really the best use of Hyde's money? Um, if we disposed of this asset, could we build two, three, or even four more properties in a different location? Um, and, and that is what's behind our, our churning of assets um, at Void. Um, and actually, in using this data to target um, the properties that we think we can get um, the best value from using differently, uh, we managed to achieve a target of 13.3 million. Um, raised from disposals last year against a target of about 12 and a half million um, and again just to reiterate that that money doesn't go into um, champagne for, for shareholders that money all gets reinvested into our services and, and building replacement homes and, and new homes so that's at an individual level. Um, at a group level, um, I talked before we group together things. Um, we've had a we've, in our third year now of a stock rationalisation program. Um, so we've used the AIM information to inform that. We've gone down from I think we had over 80 local authorities at the beginning. We're now down to just over 70. Um, and that rationalisation we think is going to help us be be more efficient in the way that we manage those the, that stock and also give a better service to our customers. Um, we're also looking at it this year in, in terms of how we use it to inform our our very grandly titled strategic asset management plan um, and that really is, is used by our treasury team to look at our long-term investment planning um, and, and considering how best we use our assets. I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I will skip quickly on to the next one. Um, external decorations, I know it sounds thrilling, um, this is quite an old chestnut for most housing associations. Um, this is just a nice example of where um, taking the data, having a look at it and, and challenging some of your, your existing perceptions can, can generate some really good insights. So we had a fairly typical program, um, it was due to cost us um, four, £47.5 million pounds over seven years. Um, it was based on um, the last date of property and some standard assumptions about when we would need to revisit that. Um, we decided to relook at this. We got some new stock condition information in. Um, we decided to take the data out of our systems. We put it into um, Tableau and did a bit of exploration to see what we could find. So this slide is a screenshot from Tableau. Um, and essentially what we found is that by looking at the actual condition of the property, uh, we could challenge some of those assumptions about when we next re needed to visit. Um, and what we found is that based on the stock condition survey, we could probably extend that average out um, from 6.3 years to about 8.3 years. Um, why is that important? Um, it's important um, because it changes the financial profile of our program. So to get there, 
we, we recategorised jobs into two new life cycles. So that was five years where um, it was specified for a particular job where it was required and seven years for all the remaining jobs. Um, we also then looked at grouping and clustering properties with similar postcodes um, and putting them into specific financial years to, to smooth out the programme. So, so what you can see at the top of that graphic um, across our different lots is, is the difference in the average number of years between visits compared to our, our what was our current programme and then what we thought it could be under the new programme using our stock condition data. Um, so what, what does that mean? Um, well, um, we are, we're quite pleased to say we think we've generated the potential to save about £1.6 million pounds per annum. Um, between uh, 2017 and 2013 um, and that really is by reducing the number of visits per year, grouping works together um, and lengthening the life cycle um, where it was appropriate um, we thought we could smooth that out. Um, so uh, I think those are the two examples. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to the next presenter I think because I've talked for long enough already. I think I've had my allotted time minute, uh, 10 minutes. Um, but I'm very happy to, to take questions while other people are talking or, or at the end of the presentation. Thanks very much Kate. Um, plenty to get our teeth into there. Um, and I know a couple of people are uh, using the question box already. I'd encourage you to fire your questions away um, and uh, make make all our, all our analysts work for their money. Um, <laughs> and uh, right, so thank, thanks, Kate. Um, and uh, next up, we've got Muriel Bankhead, head of research and analysis for Genesis. So Muriel, it's over to you. Good morning. Um, let me begin by introducing Genesis Housing Association. We're a member of the G15, housing 100,000 tenants and residents in almost 33,000 homes, which collectively have a value of 7.27 billion. We're based in London and the South East, and we're a top three social landlord in Brent, Barnet, Westminster, and in Camden. Interestingly, we have a broad mix of property tenures with over 15,000 general needs stock plus 1,200 affordable and intermediate rents and, and temporary housing. Our second largest group of customers are leaseholders and shared owners. Almost one in 10 live in supported housing and we have over 850 market rent units and around 1,400 key worker places. And this makes quite a difference to the information that we need. It makes it really important for us to understand our customers the current needs in our existing properties, focusing on affordability, suitability and running costs. But we also need to examine their future needs and aspirations of properties and of tenancies, while exploring the quality and design options for future homes and different build options. Therefore, we need good customer satisfaction data to ensure we achieve continuous improvement using a virtuous feedback cycle of measurement, action and results. We use the leadership factor to conduct two waves of research each year and we benchmark these against all companies and of course against the housing sector. In addition to these key drivers, we undertake transactional satisfaction surveys, post repair and ad hoc surveys for different groups of residents, like for example our post project resident surveys to measure satisfaction with new homes. In common with the rest of the housing sector, we present data to core on our general needs customers. And here we can see some of the key differences between social and affordable rent customers and supported housing where single men predominate. It's really important that we understand these characteristics in order to plan for the provision that we need to meet their needs. The housing sector is operating in uncertain times with a raft of new statutory and regulatory changes from right to buy to welfare reform, which may challenge the bottom line as rent reduction has. The ne there's never been a greater need for research and financial modelling to steer our way through this changing political landscape. Um, we, need, we need to make the right investment decisions. Sorry, I just need to reload that. We need to make the right investment decisions based on the evidence and at Genesis Research is the foundation of our investment strategy, targeting areas with potential for growth and value uplift and assessing which boroughs we should partner with. Our new business and asset management teams rely on information on the housing market in our borough pricing analysis and the review of crucial housing and planning policies and the local authorities' core strategies 
and their local plans. Finally, the research and analysis team produced site-specific market intelligence, desktop valuations, and pricing recommendations. The assessment of Genesis boroughs takes account of development opportunities, including housing zones and net dwelling targets, affordability for residents, and competition from other registered providers to determine whether Genesis should be investing or divesting of stock. Research is also vital for the efficiency of our operations, using stock and demographic information to design and plan our estates and housing management systems and services with the aim of reducing void times and increasing customer satisfaction. Managing more commercial tenures requires different analysis on the length of time it takes to sale completion or market letting, as these models vary substantially from social lets through the nomination process. In Stratford, for example, Genesis let 400 rent flats in a single building. Staircasing is a very important part of our revenue. Staircasing, as most people know, is the um, operation of people buying an additional portion of a shared ownership home. It produces increased revenue and owner satisfaction in equal measure. To assist our marketing teams, we examine the peak years for staircasing to, uh, to target communications with residents. But all housing associations face considerable challenges with data quality. I can recall a presentation from the Nat Fed showing a cluster of housing association residents aged over 110 because many housing association staff recorded the date of birth of the 1st of January 1900 as the real date was unknown. It's easy to see that people rarely live to 117, but it may be hard to spot other distortions in the data. So does data quality matter? The answer is yes, and increasingly so. The general data protection regulations will come in next year, and data accuracy is necessary for the introduction of new technology. As data birth is an important security question, it's vital for the successful introduction of digital platforms like the Genesis app. This led to Genesis introducing a data quality project to collect and backfill customers' dates of birth where they were missing. Our aim is to achieve 100% accuracy, obviously. Better data is really important for making smarter decisions. With new technology user ID requirements and changes to the GDPR, it makes it mandatory for housing associations. Most importantly, it enables housing associations to offer better services to our customers, to achieve better value for money by reducing our costs at the same time. Thank you for listening. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Muriel. Um, uh, again, lots to get our teeth into. Um, and there's uh, plenty of questions starting to be asked um, in the, the questions box. So again, if our panelists can um, uh, dart in there and, and start answering some of those questions, that would be great. Um, yeah, thanks again, Muriel. Muriel. And um, next up, we've got Andy Bradley, Strategic Insight Manager at Sovereign. Andy, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Hopefully you can see my screen. So I'm going to be talking to you about some of the work we're doing at Sovereign. Um, more specifically looking at our strategy team, which is where I sit, and looking at how we're using data and analysis to help inform our strategic direction. I think uh, I've also got the same issue of slides, so bear with me. Starting, I think, as is tradition now, with the uh, the map of our stock and our operating area. Uh, Sovereign operate in the southeast and southwest of England. You can see there we've got about 56,000 homes, 130,000 residents. Um, following a recent merger with Spectrum Housing, we're almost up to 2,000 staff now. And what's really interesting for us is we've got a very consolidated geography, and that's a key part of our strategy. So I'm going to be focusing on the work we do strategically. And I just want to spend a moment explain. About a year ago, we defined a schema of data that we thought was important. So we've currently got two housing systems, two asset management systems all following the merger. We've got Click as a reporting solution. We've also got an enterprise uh, web mapping system. So we define the data we thought was relevant and we pull all of that through from our internal data sources into our, our data model. Um, and then we augment that data with information from external parties. So we work with CACI in terms of customer segmentation, an awful lot of data from places like the ONS, uh, Stat Explore, so lots of government data from DCLG, property values from valuation office, that kind of thing. Um, we join all of our data back together, so any data set we hold is related to one another via either a property reference number or via a geographic link, and that's really important to us in terms of the research we undertake. 
As a team, we focus on things like government policy, so benefit cap, and trying to predict what impact that's going to have, how many customers will be impacted. With universal credit, we're currently working out how many of our homes uh, are likely to be on universal credit and what that will mean to our average uh, arrears over time and doing some forward modelling for the next few years. Uh, we do analysis of things like the LHA cap and specifically the under 35s, and the shared accommodation rate and predicting how many of our homes will be impacted and how severely they'll be impacted. In this presentation, I've pulled out just one example. Um, it's some research we've been doing for our new strategy. Following our merger, we're working on a new strategic direction. And specifically, we were asked to look into the income of our residents and the affordability of our housing products. So to define affordability, we came up with our a simplistic affordability triangle. And um, what we were saying here is that affordability is a balance between uh, how much you earn your income, how much you spend on your house or your rent, but then also your composition. So in this case, depending on what your family makeup is, it's what your expenses are. So two adults versus a single adult with three children, they have very different outgoings. So affordability uh, is based on all of those things interacting. In a very simplistic example here, we, we've looked at affordability in different ways. So what does it mean to us? Internally, we use a 40% trigger. So that's to make sure that people aren't spending more than 40% of their, of their net, uh, sorry, their gross uh, earnings on, on their rent. And if it's more than that, we'll just make sure that tenancy is viable. We want to make sure that our tenancies are sustained. But we also look at um, affordability in terms of freedom from housing benefit. And some of the analysis you'll see references back to how many of our homes have to rely on housing benefit in order to make their, their homes affordable. And also looking at things like the living rent calculations as well. So it's not just one measure of affordability, there's multiple. So one of the things we use is our core data return. So that's uh, for every tenancy we start, we send off some data about uh, who's moving in, their family composition and their earnings. And, and a very high level summary here showing that the, you know, the older residents really are our lowest income group in Sovereign, followed by our single adults and our lone parents. But as we move up towards our two adult families, especially those without children and the larger families, we do see higher incomes needed to sustain those tenancies. What we also see is much higher benefit dependency amongst those older people and those single adults. We also find that income varies significantly by location, and this is something that was quite surprising to many people to look at. So this is the uh, ASHI data, the hourly survey of, uh, sorry, the annual survey of hourly earnings, showing lower quartile income and breaking the country down into, uh, into four even quartiles. And looking at our operating area, we have some of the highest income areas, but also places like the Isle of Wight, some of the lowest income areas. So across just our consolidated operating geography, you know, there's really important differences in terms of locational income. We also share with our executive board and our board the importance of age, um, especially when we're talking about things like the under 35s. As you go through your life stages, you're likely to earn more money um, through the middle part, certainly early on with less experience. You're less likely to earn as much. So when we talk about products, we're trying to make sure that people think about who we're aiming it for and what they're likely to earn as well at that life stage. And that's, that's been really interesting to see the, the reaction from people. Getting into more of the sort of detailed analysis, one of the things we looked at was our actual rental product. So what this graph is showing you is the one, two, and three, four bedroom homes. And the SR is our social rents, the AR are affordable rents. I'm looking at the difference between our, really our, our lower quartile and upper quartile rents. So in the green circles there, I've pulled out our three bedroom homes. And what that's showing you is because of social rents being set by formula, we've got quite a, a concise rental range. When we look at our affordable rents, there's a really significant range, first of all, they vary, but also, there's about £40 a week difference between the upper quartile of our three-bedroom social rents to the lower quartile of our affordable rents. And, and that's a challenge that our board now looking into, that there isn't a smooth range of housing products. There's a big jump from our social rents to affordable rents. And that's one of the reasons why Sovereign haven't been converting to affordable rents for some years. One of the other things we wanted to share um, is how do our products vary in terms of the income our residents have? So we make sure we do affordability checks. And, and what we found using, our again, our core data from our internal lettings in the last uh, year or so, there's a significantly higher income needed than our residents. So our affordable rent homes for one, one adult families have something in the region of sort of uh, you know, six, seven thousand pounds higher income to afford those, those homes. And, and the same for two adult families, nearly, uh, nearly eight thousand pound difference in terms of earnings. So we're housing quite different people into those products to make sure they're affordable. And that final part of the affordability triangle, looking at the, the role of uh, the composition of the family. So uh, the government has an allowance lookup table when looking at things like housing benefit. 
So we've applied that. So taking here just the same two bedroom property in, in the Vale of Whitehorse with the same rent of £107. You can see here a single adult, according to the government allowances, would only need to earn about thirteen and a half thousand. However, a two adult family with, with one child would need to earn uh, £19,000, so you know, £6,000 more. So when we look at a property, it's not just the building itself, it's also looking at who's likely to live in it and therefore what income is required for them. The, the reason you see that exclamation mark on the single adult is, of course, this is a two bedroom home and if they were under 35, they would be subject to the LHA cap, which is a significant challenge for many of our residents. The final chart I wanted to share with you is some research we've been looking into just how are our tenants changing. So the pie on the left hand side there is showing you our existing composition of households. So that big green chunk there is our, our older people, um, the large orange one, the multi-adults. What you'll see on the right hand side is quite a different chart and that's our core lettings report from the last year. What, what we're seeing now is we're housing quite different people in our portfolio. So a lot more uh, larger families, lone parents especially, uh, and even more single working age families. And, and if you think about those slides I shared earlier, those lower incomes, those single working age people. So what we've been sharing with the board is that we're housing different people and what does that mean so are these people going to want to interact with us differently are they more likely to be digitally engaged which is great for us with our communication strategy but do they need more support are they going to become more reliant on housing benefit so just this one piece of research really was aimed for our executive board and our, and our board to share with them and, and i think there's sort of a few key highlights here one is the significant variation in income both through people's age, so through their life stages, but also geographically, just in our confined operating area. So there's some challenges around that. We're also seeing those challenges around our affordable rents and our social rents, and they are you know, distinctly different products that require distinctly different incomes to make them truly affordable. As a really quite a, a generalized <laughs> summary, we found that our social rent figures, they seem to be quite affordable for those earning around a 10th percentile uh, income. But for many of our affordable homes in many of our local authorities, you really do need to be earning a sort of lower quartile income. And in some of our more expensive areas, some of them are going up to as much as a medium quartile income to really make those affordable. And finally, just relating that back to the topic of today, really, around uh, forecasting the future. You know, for Sovereign, what we're doing in, in our team and strategy is, is looking at our internal data, but augmenting it with external data to really get a fuller, more richer picture of our customers and our business. What's really important is that we're taking this data-driven approach and, and the whole business is talking about that and that's what people expect to see now. It's not just subjective, it's actually based on some real some real data behind the scenes. And, and we're sharing that with, with every level of the business. I've talked about this being for our board, but actually we're sharing it with operational teams to get their feedback and, and it's great for them to hear that we're, we're putting this much attention into the affordability of our housing products. So that's it from me and as everyone else said, happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, uh, and again, actually lots of questions coming in now, so um, yeah, keep, keep them coming. I'll pick up on as many as possible afterwards. Um, so we're moving on to the uh, final presentation, um, and after that we'll move into the questions and answers. So keep lots of questions coming in, and we'll get through as many of them as possible. Um, and I can certainly see plenty of them are being answered as we, as we go along. Right. Um, thanks again, Andy. And um, now over to Paul Clark, Director of Devlin. Um, Paul, it's over to you, and then we'll take some questions. Thanks, Frank. Okay, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, good afternoon. My name's Paul Clark from Dublin Consulting. Uh, we're uh, management and analytics consultants, um, and we use finance and data analytics to help businesses become more profitable and, and sustainable. Um, and you can see on the slide there, we've worked for uh, people like Claren Group, Network Homes, and a range of small housing providers, smaller housing providers as well. And although we're heavily developed, heavily involved in developing analytical solutions, we actually focus quite heavily upon the performance of teams uh, within our clients and specifically making sure they can continue what we do. Uh, so we're actually very heavily involved in training as well. And I want to be a little bit different on this presentation. I want to move away slightly from the data and I want to focus more upon you. In particular, if you identify with the person in the middle of this picture, uh, someone who's instrumental in providing decision makers with the information they need and you might be an operations manager, a performance and reporting analyst, a management accountant, uh, an IT manager. Now if this is your role, the chances are it is getting more and more demanding, uh, possibly because decision makers in your business are getting busier, critical questions are coming more quickly, um, because you realize that your business could be doing so much more with the data that's available and you're working hard to make it happen. Well, whichever it is, your role is crucial. 
Your business has to help you to make it work, otherwise decisions may simply not happen or they may lead to the wrong choices being made. In either case, you know, the implications could be profound. So my link to the uh, subject today is, uh, in our view, one of the best ways to make better use of data and smarter decisions is to make your role as influential and as effective as possible. And the most important step is about identity. It's about you becoming more of what I would call an influential partner to the business in the provision of information. It means spending less time looking in the rearview mirror reporting what's already happened and more time collaborating with those in a decision making role to build your own picture about what lies ahead and what decisions may be needed. And then using information which will be overwhelmingly visual in nature as the examples you've seen today already are and information that's easily understood to lead decision makers to take a particular point of view about the future, grasp the points at issue, agree the choices and options that are available to them. And this is for two reasons. It's helping the decision making process to accelerate and become more effective. And it's also being able to target exactly the data that you need. So let me give you an example. Imagine you're in a team of uh, professional care staff serving a community of retired folk with ages, ages rather, ranging from 60 to over 100. Finance is already tight and they're going to get tighter because over the next 10 years, care demands are going to rise sharply as everyone gets older. And because professional carers are already in short supply, big pay rises may be necessary. And by the way, this isn't a hypothetical example. What decisions are needed today to allow this community to continue to thrive? As what I would call an information partner, you will already know what decisions are needed and you will also have information ready that ensures the right decisions get made. For example, a very colourful infographic, this one. This is, an infog or this is the infographic that was designed to bring people to the same understanding of the issue and engage them in thinking about solutions. Now, I know our audience of Sharp Minds will have already figured out what this is saying. However, let's break it down into its separate layers, starting from the top. The first layer sets the scene. It reminds people of things they should already know. We have an age range from 60 to 100, the x-axis, with a count of residents in each age bracket provided by the yellow bars. And we have a weekly cost of care indicated by the blue dots. Unsurprisingly, if you're 60 or so, you need very little care. So the left-hand dot is close to the bottom of the chart. And if you're 95 and over, you need a lot. So the right-hand dot is close to the top. Multiply our resident numbers, the bars, by the cost of care they need, the dots, and we have a total weekly cost of care. The second layer builds the story. It says, well, people are going to get older. And the percentages shown indicate how much their care costs per week are likely to rise. And we will have to pay more for our staff. At the bottom on the left, you can see that we've assumed perhaps 40% more. All of which means that our weekly cost of care will rise by this amount. Finally, the third layer delivers the punchline. Yes, but there are things we can do specifically as shown at the bottom on the left. We already know that volunteers and family can do some of the things that the professionals do. And we know there is some great assistive technology around. We're pretty sure these two factors will reduce our care costs by the percentages shown, which will offset the increase in costs by this amount, which is almost a million pounds per annum. That's a sizable prize. So let's now decide what we have to do to bring more volunteers and family into the picture and make best use of technology. Now, as infographics go, this is far from perfect, but the point is it does the job because it only takes a couple of minutes for it to be clear where the debate needs to be headed and what decisions are needed. Now, people will quite rightly challenge the figures. Where did the data come from? Who produced it? Is there anything that we can cross-reference it to? There are bound to be weaknesses in the data, and if so, the numbers might change, 
as revisions come through or measures of uncertainty are built in. But crucially, the debate about potential solutions will have already started and will be unlikely to be thrown off course. And there's a high probability that the right decisions be made. So, focusing on the role of the person, to build, start to build your opinion about where what I call the decision value priorities lie. Get people to talk about how they're seeing the world ahead. And whilst they're talking, get them to sketch. This is a little bit far from looking like data, but this was produced in one of the major suppliers of asset services to the sector. And the question at the top of the finance director's mind was the one scribbled at the top of the sketch. Why are we making such a small margin on a key repairs contract? Now, sketching the problem revealed how he was seeing the issue. At the end of each year, he had a negative variance on contract costs, the upward sloping red line at the top. Stuff was clearly going wrong that was costing them money or losing them revenue. And he could imagine a set of lines, the upward sloping ones at the bottom, representing a count of each of those things and some sort of chart that somehow explained conclusively that, well, these must be the root causes, that there was a clear correlation between these and the costs causing the missing margin. And of course, when others see the sketch, they start to understand the issue the same way. They add to the sketch. This, by the way, is a reproduction of the original, which was the original was too illegible to present. And having seen and possibly contributed the sketch, they have no trouble in interpreting the actual data when it's produced. There were four root causes in the end, indicated by the layers at the bottom, each one a particular process failure. Now, this sort of highly visual exercise not only helps you to produce something that's very relevant, it helps everyone to be literally on the same page and ready to move forward. But equally important, it allows you to target only the data you need, extracting from it larger data sets, extracting it from larger data sets, or if it is not available, figuring out how to make it so. So in, in conclusion to my bit today, I wanted to focus on less on the data and more about the person and about becoming an influential partner in the provision of information, whoever you are in the business. And if so, and you want to be better at this, remember that decision making is a process. Success depends upon you stepping into the shoes of your customer, the decision maker, and asking what do they need? How do they want to make decisions? Be visual in everything you do. You can be sure that within a management team near to you, there'll be one person who wants to see a spreadsheet and another who hates them. A third who wants a few bullet points and a fourth who wants a three page report. Clear, simple visual images steer around differences such as these. Now, imagine you are an investigative journalist. Be curious and inquisitive. Recognize there are others in the same position as well. Get together and collaborate and work very closely with the CIO, the CTO, IT director. They have many pivotal roles to play, data development and governance, systems, application support, coordination and oversight of various analytical initiatives. And they'll have people with brilliant technical skills who I'm sure would love to provide you with support. Get trained. This is to do with information about business operations. There are a set of right questions you can ask that will help to trigger the right debate. There are ways in which you can understand and model how your part of the business operates and where the commercial opportunities might lie. And there are design skills. How to develop information that responds to and perhaps challenges perceptions and perceived wisdom. And finally, see this as an opportunity, not to simply increase your workload by attempting to do more, but to change what you do away from things that don't add a great deal of value and towards things that do. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and thank you to all, all of our um, uh, panelists um, who are now uh, we're moving into the question and answer session. So picking up um, your questions, so keep them coming in and I'll look out for them in the box and pick up as many as we possibly can um, moving forward. Um, I'm going to start with um, a question from uh, the audience. Um, and it was about uh, from uh, James Jervis. Uh, are saying that demand for housing was mentioned and it was interested in how people are trying to understand demand across localities. Is it just through um, internal data around turnover, et cetera, 
or are there, are there useful sources out there? So are you just using your existing data? Um, are you bringing in other, other sources? Um, and, and how do you kind of balance those, um, uh, uh, those two? Um, so I'll move to Kate first on that, if that's okay. So uh, Kate. Yeah, hello. Um, yes, so I think in the in the AIM model example that I showed you, um, that, that's largely internal data. Um, because it, it comes out of our systems and into our data warehouse, but, but that's not the limit of the demand data that we look at. So um, the other sources, if you like, the external pieces of information, um, we quite often, we will select different bits of information depending on what we're investigating. Um, so if we're looking at demand for social housing, for example, um, we will look for what publicly available information there is about local waiting lists, or if it's not publicly available, talk to our local authority partners and see what information they're willing to share with us so sometimes through um, either um, forums or one-to-one -one connections um, people are willing to share information where they can um, we also increasingly we're using kind of external housing market data so there are various quarterly um, reports on, on the housing market mainly around sales um, but we, we certainly use that to inform our development program and our development strategy um, but it can also be um, there's quite often information out there about the rental market as well which we can use um, to glean information about what the demand for, for rental products is in, in, in the various areas that we work in. Um, I think I also mentioned in my response uh, the, the NHF um, do a, a really nice digest of housing statistics at the end of the year. Um, I can't remember what it's called, I think it's usually called Home Truths, but um, there is some information in there about demand uh, and it's broken down by region so um, you, can, you can start to look at what the demand is in, in local areas there. Right, thanks very much. And um, same question um, for Muriel, please. Hello. Um, yes, we, we talked about this around the evidence-based decisions that we make. Um, at local authority level, there's quite a lot of information available through the local authorities themselves. So each of them has a statutory obligation to produce a strategic housing market assessment of the need in their borough. And that is matched by the strategic land availability assessment because it's not always possible in boroughs like Westminster to actually have the land availability to meet the demand, even though it's there. And those, those, those are key sources which are usually represented in their core strategy in their local plan. So that's a very good place to start at a, at a local borough level. Uh, on a wider level, actually, um, GCLG publish a lot of data about housing lists, as Kate said. Um, but, but also, um, the, the London plan will have targets for dwellings, and there'll be net dwelling targets, again, at local authority level, which are worth looking at. In a more specific way, um, you can actually get a lot of information about sites that have been developed and the number of units that are going through the planning and construction process. For London particularly, that's available through Mollior, and they also produce private rent uh, reports that will actually show you what, what, um, what's available in different developments, what, what the charges are for those market rent units, etc. And that makes it really easy on a very site-specific basis to make comparisons between what you're offering to a private rent market and what your competitors are bringing to market as well. So I hope that helps. Yeah, really useful. And um, uh, yeah, keep questions coming. So if there are any follow-ups from that, then um, keep firing them at, uh, at our panelists. Um, I'm going to move on to another question. So I want to get through as many as possible during this um, um, session. Uh, so I think this was uh, aimed at you, Paul. Um, so I'll come to you first, and then I'll, I'll move to Andy. Um, so and Paul, the question was um, uh, from David Noble, and it was, how do you deal with issues of correlation and causation? Um, how can you be certain that things are related? Um, and how can you demonstrate things uh, aren't related, um, even if they appear to be connected? Um, so, Paul, if you can pick up on that first, and then um, Andy, I'll come to you next. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I was just, reply <laughs> I was just replying to David, and I realised that my, my typing speed wasn't quick enough for this, for this one. Uh, it's a really critical question, and there's two things about this. Um, first of all, data visualisation is critical. Um, because actually we are very, very good visually at, at spotting trends and spotting outliers and that sort of thing. And, uh, and that, but particularly with very large amounts of data, we should, we should use our eyes to do just that. So we need ways of visualizing data. But secondly, because we want to try and find out something that constitutes evidence like correlation and causation, we don't, we have to use stats. Uh, we can show these things mathematically. Um, 
and by the way, this is an, I think this is a very important skill for information professionals. Um, now, the 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 the, uh, the stats around this uh, re relate specifically to what I would, things which I call confidence intervals. It's being able to say, for example, if I'm forecasting a number into the future, it's being able to look at the data that leads to that forecast, looking at the errors, particularly in that data. And then being able to say, based on those areas, that we have a certain level of confidence that a forecasted figure, for example, um, is uh, it, we, we, we have a measure which allows us to ha understand the level of confidence we have in that forecast uh, figure going forward. So um, now those are simple statistical tools that you can use, but you have to have a very good understanding of the data in order to use them well. So my very inadequate answer in the short time we have is to do two things, really understand how to use the statistics in this way, but actually back that up with data visualization. Because typically when we talk about using data as evidence, even if we do show these things are mathematically, there is a causation, a correlation that's there that we should believe in and we should trust. We tend only to trust those findings when our eyeballs tell us that the results make sense. Interesting. And um, yeah, Andy, so, uh, same question to you, if, if that's okay. Um, that that uh, relationship between cor correlation and causation, how you how you kind of distinguish between the two, um, and I'd be interested to know whether there's any times where you kind of challenge any received wisdoms um, um, uh, during your work. Yeah, okay, sorry, it would help if I unmute myself. Um, yeah, actually, I think the, the the previous answer was actually really good from Paul in terms of being really careful. Um, I'm not an expert in very much in our business. My team are really good at looking at data and understanding it, and the way we try and resolve this as much as possible is by working with those business area experts. So when we do find a pattern or a trend, we, we try to put the time in, and I think the visualization really helps, but to actually sit with them and talk to them about it and say, this is what we found. You know, does that match your expectation? And actually, people are pretty quick to pick that up, and we, we've tried to encourage uh, you know, an environment where someone can challenge us. So what we found is if we overcomplicate something, and then we present to people, they just sort of sit and stare and go, well, okay, and sort of nod. But actually, if you kind of build it up step by step with them and really work with them and encourage them to challenge you back, um, we found that's been a really good way of kind of getting into the complexity. Um, in terms of examples, um, one of them we came up across uh, recently, we were talking about housing benefit amounts, and uh, people were surprised to hear that a higher proportion of our residents in our affordable rent homes claim housing benefit than those in our social rented homes, because people didn't think that would be the case because they thought we were putting in these affordability checks, but actually um, that's not been the case. But then what really surprised people was the amount of housing benefit people were claiming. So people in our affordable rent homes are claiming a higher amount of housing benefit per week. But when we talked them through the data, that was easy to explain by the fact that our rents are significantly higher. So yeah, we come across those issues all the time really, and I think just that, having that conversation back up with visuals can be quite a powerful way forward. Fantastic. Um, and there's, there's lots of questions coming in, um, so I'm going to move on again um, to a question by Sarah Whittle, um, uh, who's asking about, um, I mean, we've been talking about using existing data um, um, uh, quite a lot, but um, about future data requirements that the sector may need, um, and uh, she was particularly concerned um, about uh, uh, how that might relate to communicating with residents, but um, yeah, that, that kind of if we're if we're looking about if we're thinking about what we need in the future um, and how we inform decision making, I, I guess we're also thinking about the, the type of data um, uh, that, that we're going to need moving forward. So how how are you coming to conclusions about you know where the gaps are, what you're going to need um, uh, moving forward? And I will move to Muriel first on that, please. Hello. Yes, I, th I think that's a really important question because as this. Uh, presentation webinar has shown, we tend to focus very much on the quantitative data. And what is really important, the part that's perhaps missing in this, is actually understanding our customers, understanding how they perceive things, how they value things, what new, um, what new services and uh, uh, properties they're, they're looking for. And the best way to approach that is to have a mix of qualitative research as well as the quantitative analysis, because that's the best way of actually sitting with people and understanding what, what they like, what their preferences are, um, what their needs are, and also the language that they use to describe those so that we can communicate with them easily in language that they can understand. Hope that answers your question. 
Uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, fantastic. Thanks very much. And um, Kate, uh, same question to you. So, because I, th I think this is quite a fundamental one um, for people to be wrestling with. Not not only um, what does your data tell you about what you need to do with your business, but actually how do you work out what data you're going to need um, moving forward? So. Um, yeah, okay, so I think probably I'll break it down into, into two categories. So um, thinking about um, customers again, so we are increasingly looking at our, our online channels. I think Sarah specifically mentioned that. So I'd say it's really basic and it's not necessarily new, but really, really good contact information. Um, and so particularly mobile phone numbers um, and email addresses so that you can actually make use of those new digital channels. Um, lots and lots of bits of software or for the opportunity for, for mass texting, but, but they're no good if you haven't got decent quality mobile telephone numbers that you can, you can use to make them work. Um, I think for us also, it's about looking at uh, patterns in our customer contacts. So, uh, how are people using those digital channels? Um, we actually formed. It's the the beautifully titled Omni Team now. That's part of our customer services, who are in charge of of managing. Um, uh, contacts from residents that come in via social media um, and they're actually looking at you know patterns of how people use social media when people use it uh, what are the types of things so it tends to be um, expressions of dissatisfaction so thinking about how you engage with people via those channels when they're probably doing that because they're, they're expressing frustration um, at, at having uh, the response they've had through another channel so we're, we're actively looking at not only our own customers but what are the trends out there in the market there's an awful lot of information out there about, about how to use social media effectively so, so that's another source of data um, I guess the other thing that I think a lot of people have, have, have meant or people are thinking about and how they might use is is getting information directly from our assets so again thinking about using new technology um, you know can you get uh, your your, your assets to report back to you via devices that are installed rather than having to go out and do stock condition surveys and that's something that we're starting to think about um, and I think the, the other element to say is I think um, it's less probably about new data but it's probably about really really making good use of the information you've got um, and particularly around um, customers payment methods for example so thinking about responses to universal credit um, we did quite a lot of work monitoring um, the patterns that people people fall into around payments who are the people who we know um, using our customer segmentation are the most likely to struggle um, and actually targeting them um, um, up front getting them onto um, direct payments getting them onto standing orders um, and making sure that we're proactively approaching those people Fantastic. And um, Paul, I'm going to move to you next. And yeah, that, that kind of similar question or, or uh, related. Um, yeah, how, how do you use your existing data perhaps to, to work out what, what, what data you need in the future um, uh, moving forward? So, Paul, please. Sorry, I forgot to uh, I, I unmute myself. Um, <laughs> for, for me, uh, I. Uh, tend actually not to work so much with the data uh, when the question about what we need in the future is concerned because I want to get into the minds of the of decision makers, the strategists, and I want to look out into the world and try and find out what sort of m movements and what sort of um, d direction those particular forces are, ha are, are, are beginning to take us in. Because uh, for me, if you clarify the question first, that is probably the most important question that you think is coming up into the future and you then try to design the answers that are probably the the best representation of what that answer could look like and step away from the data for this move into Adobe tools or whatever it is and sketch and draw and then really share what that image looks like then the then the data you need starts to emerge now and the reason I do it that way is because actually and people may disagree with this there's actually a huge amount of data around and there's also a lot of data inside organizations the problem we have is, is, is accessing it. I'll just give you a very quick example. A piece of work we were involved in was predictive analytics to try and predict uh, whether uh, which residents were going to abandon their homes. Uh, we're only talking a few per year out of many, many thousands of residents. Now, at the end of the day, the best thing we did was to try and design what the solution looked like and the, what probably the, the driving forces, understand what the driving forces were that would lead someone to do that. And when we did that, we realized that the data was there. Um, but it was very, very hard to reach. It was all about measures of contact with the customer, looking at measures of stress in the, late, in the relationship that you have between the customer 
and and the registered provider looking at patterns of payment looking at patterns of communication and when we started to do that some of the patterns that were really interesting started to come out now I couldn't have predicted what that data would be um, prior to getting out onto the shop floor so to speak riding with the housing officers really understanding how they look at the world and then thinking to ourselves what does that mean in terms of, 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 of the data we need so I would probably say the data is going to be there a lot of the data you need but try and turn this process on its head not look at the data and ask what in the data do we need but start looking at the question and then work backwards and look at the data Fantastic. Now we're we're running short on time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna run with one more question. Um, again, coming from uh, the the audience, um, but I'm gonna kind of morph it with uh, one of my own. So um, I, the, the question I was gonna ask was, what's the single biggest challenge for housing providers on the horizon, and how should they plan for it? Um, and the question that I think came from the audience was, uh, what are the effects of Brexit on social housing? So. Um, take, take a pick on uh, one or the other, um, and uh, but certainly in terms of the, the biggest challenges that, that you think or challenge that you think the, that's on the horizon for housing providers and how you're planning for it. Um, so um, Andy, I'm going to hurl that one at you first, and then I'm going to move down the panel, um, finishing with Paul, um, and then we'll wrap things up. So um, Andy, Craigie, that's a that's a huge question. <laughs> So you're trying to keep my answer brief. I think probably right now for us it's looking at things like uh, the rent reduction and, and what's going to happen to rents after 2020. So I'm actually on the NHF's task and finish group for um, potentially going for some sort of rent flexibility. Um, so that's where we're looking at uh, things at the moment. So I think that's potentially going to be massive for us, but with the election coming up as well, it'll be interesting to see what happens. So in terms of planning from our side, you know, we've, we've got all kinds of financial modeling, as I'm sure everyone does, about what options might come out in terms of CPI plus or potentially minus in the future. Um, we've also been looking at you know, the way social rents are calculated right now with formula and actually there's a huge, you know, a few huge real problems with the way that's, that's working. It's so out of date that formula that even just modernising that can have a significant difference. So um, yeah, for us I think future rent setting and what that might look like is a, is a big business challenge. Thanks very much and um, yeah, certainly a significant area of uncertainty. Um, Kate, uh, yeah, what's, what's the uh, single big, biggest challenge as far as you're concerned or uh, one of the biggest challenges and um, your thoughts on how uh, that can be addressed perhaps? Um, I guess, probably, boringly, probably a similar answer around the financial challenges. So, so the same things that have already been talked about around uh, the future rent setting model. Um, but I think also we are working really hard to think about how we can carry on delivering new homes. Um, it's a big priority for Hyde, uh, got a long history of development. And I think for us, it's thinking about how can we make our business, firstly, uh, the most most efficient it can be um, in order that we can reinvest money into developing new homes. Secondly, thinking creatively about financing. Um, so you might have seen um, a couple of weeks ago we had a, a very successful bond issue from one of our subsidiaries, but we're, we're always thinking of newer and creative ways um, to get funding into the business. So, you know, accepting that the grant model is, 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 is long gone, the old world is long gone, um, how can we carry on getting money in order to build those new homes that people desperately need? So I think that's probably the biggest challenge um, is on financing and I would say the same thing about Brexit really, so that the impact of Brexit I think for us it's really that the macroeconomic impact of Brexit, so what will that do to the housing market, what will it do to the finance markets, um, what will it do to the labour market, um, both for people we need to build homes and also the people living in our homes. Yes, and uh, yeah, so asking the right questions um, uh, vital as well. Um, Muriel, um, uh, same question to you, if that's okay. Yes, well, I, 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 I would um, I, I would reinforce what uh, Kate and Andy have said. I, I think the rent reduction is really crucial to us because it affects the bottom line, and it would be really helpful if we if we could move to renegotiating that in the near future. And I think there's also a challenge in the delivery of new homes, but. Not to repeat those, I think one of the other challenges that we're facing as, as an organisation is that we provide um, 4,000 uh, supported homes at the moment and a, and a number of other care and support services. And I think there's a very uncertain climate around uh, how that's going to be funded going forward. There's been a lot of talk in the media about 
the funding of social care. And I, I know that a number of other housing associations have, have actually decided to withdraw from that area be, because the profitability is uh, under challenge at the moment with the current welfare regime. So I think that this is, this is a major challenge for us going forward. It's one we haven't got the answer for yet, but it's certainly something we're going to be grappling with over the next year or so. Thanks, thanks very much, Muriel. And um, yeah, some, some big, big topics come up here. So I think there's about five other webinars that um, uh, we could we can pick up on. Um, Paul, um, same question to you about um, um, uh, the the big uh, the big issues um, dominating uh, the horizon, and some fi final thoughts, uh, perhaps. So, uh, Paul, thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, I think my answer, <laughs> boringly, is going to be a little bit uh, in with the, the other presenters, and Bureau just touched, touched on it just now. Uh, we've done a lot of work in helping uh, communities think through how to reduce care costs. Um, and for me, this is the, the, the big issue that as a society we have to face. And, uh, and I think that uh, housing providers are going to find themselves there, uh, whether they like it or not, in a way. But there's some tremendously good work being done around the sector, and again, there'll be about 10 webinars on this one, about how the way that communi communities of residents can change the way they, 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 they work together, they sustain themselves. And actually, in my talk, I was kind of in that territory, uh, with some very important and big findings to, 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 uh, to deliver in terms of how costs of care can be reduced, how people can be um, kept healthier, more uh, self-sustaining, uh, less time in hospital, basically aging well, and aging well quite often with some quite complex health needs. These for me are the big issues, and there's, a little, there's an awful lot of dip work being done in the sector about the use of data, the use of analytics, and the use of, of assistive technology to really look at how these, these communities can, can work. That, that for me is, is, is the big one. Look, looking longer term, and again, there's another five webinars on this one. As consultants, we've worked in sectors which are kind of ahead of the housing sector in a way in terms of changing their identities. For example, we've worked in utilities that were privatized many years ago. We've worked in higher education, which is, they see themselves now as very, very commercial organizations. And probably my, my last line I would just like to offer is that I think the future for people like housing associations is a very tough challenge. It is to maintain that social imperative, maintain that social contract, but see themselves as taking all the commercial opportunities they can. And if you look outside of the sector, look into other sectors, you'll see sectors that have done that, kept their identities clear, kept their identities intact in terms of their core purpose, their core mission, but at the same time become very effective commercial entities. I think that's probably where the thinking needs to be. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, and uh, huge amounts of uh, food for thought from all of our panelists um, today. And the discussion uh, could, could have uh, car carried on for a much longer period of time. I think the time's whisked by. Um, I'd just like to round things off um, by thanking um, Devlin and Kate, Muriel, Andy, and Paul. Um, thanks to all of our panelists, and I hope you enjoyed uh, today's webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>